Thank you for joining the McCain Institute's Authors and Insights Book Talk series, a series of discussions with authors of important, newly released books on American politics, policy, and leadership. My husband fought his whole life to promote American character-driven leadership and democracy to the public, and it's incredibly important today to carry that legacy forward by any means possible. Today's installment reinforces Forcing the Importance of Modern Democracy will feature award-winning author and journalist Anne Applebaum, most well-known for her extensive literary works on the Soviet Union, Russia, and Central Europe. In her newest book, Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism, Anne details why liberal democratic ideals are being abandoned in favor of more nationalistic movements and what that means for us in the United States. Listen in as McCain Institute Executive Director Mark Green and Ann Applebaum discuss about the current state of democracy in our society. Enjoy. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Cindy, for that great introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone, to another installment of Authors and Insights book talk series presented by the McCain Institute. In this series, as Cindy said, we interview prominent authors of new books on American politics, policy, and leadership to reaffirm the importance of character driven leadership as well as American engagement and leadership in the world and the international community. And today we are joined by Ann Applebaum. So Ann Applebaum is a staff writer at The Atlantic and an award-winning historian, but that's just scratching the surface. She's also a senior fellow at the Agora Institute of Johns Hopkins University and as or has been a board member of numerous democracy and human rights organizations. Her written work has appeared in publications including, but not limited to as they say, the Spectator Magazine, The Economist, The New Yorker, The National Review, Foreign Affairs, Slate, and newspapers ranging from the Wall Street Journal and Washington Post to the Evening National Times, Sunday Telegraph, and The Guardian. Her books have received awards including the Lionel Galber Prize, the Duff Cooper Prize, the Cundo Prize, the Duke of Westminster Medal, and oh, by the way, the Pulitzer Prize. She's even written a travel log and co-authored a cookbook. Her most recent book is Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. And Anne, thank you very, very much for joining us on Authors and Insights. So th thank you very much. Um, we've just had a little catastrophic electricity issue here and I'm now doing this via my cell phone. So I'm hoping it will work and forgive me for the less than perfect picture. But I, I, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation. Well, thanks, Andy. It sounds like your book has irritated somebody who's uh, some big brother who's been uh, listening in. Yes, yes. E either that or Twilight of Democracy. We have to think it was not a metaphor; it was reality. And you know, this is democracy dying in darkness. But so, so you know, I, I usually begin by asking our guests why they wrote a book. I know why you wrote this book, right? This is your, your entire career. You obviously care deeply about topics of democracy and human rights and leadership. So let me ask it this way, uh, who's your intended audience? Who are you writing this book for? That's an interesting question. Um, usually when I have written hit mostly my history books in the past, I have had a very clear audience in mind, you know, somebody who's interested in European history, but not an expert. I had a very distinct kind of reader. Um, this book is so different from anything I've written before that I didn't have quite that preconception. Um, I think the, the, the audience is, um, you know, I mean, because the book is really intended as a kind of warning. Um, and so the audience, you know, is anybody who has been watching our politics in Western and European countries over the last decade, like I have, felt a kind of sense of discontent, wondered what it was. Um, 
and that's a broad audience. That's um, that's you know my. Of course, it's I, you know I'm aware that the book will be written by a lot of people who agree with me politically, but it's my hope that it will also be read by some people who disagree with me politically. Um, and so, and so, you know, the audience is people who live in democracies and are worried about them. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the book is heavy on Europe in part because of your own life experience. But do you see uh, the European story as uh, especially on, on awarding to American audiences? Do you see the parallels there that that should cause Americans to take note? So one of the things that the book does is it looks at. It's not that this, everything happening in every single country is the same, but there are these echoes. There are similar kinds of themes and similar emotions that I, I, I probably saw them. My husband is in politics here. Um, it's kind of my adopted country. I, I, um, I, you know, I was paying close attention to some of the kind of underground and rumblings that have been going on here for a while now. Um, but really, the the book I was inspired to write the book because I realized that so much of what I had seen in Poland was already happening in the U.S., and a version of it was already happening in the U.K. Um, and so it's not, it's you know it's not so much a warning as a you know as a detection of patterns. You know, look, this is what's going on here. It's quite a lot like what's going on over there. Um, you know, we're living through something all together simultaneously. Um, yes, I mean, in the sense that I suppose Poland hit a, um, you know, ha ha you know, began to experience the impact of a strong anti-democratic authoritarian movement a little earlier than the U.S., but I don't think it's all that different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, it, it's a it's a deep book, right? It covers lots of topics and lots of aspects of, uh, as you put it, the twilight of democracy. So it, it seems to me, as I read through it, if there's a central theme to the book, it can be captured in a quote from your book, the one party, a liberal state essentially uh, is essentially a form of political organization, not an ideology. In fact, it functions happily alongside many ideologies. So in your mind and for our audiences, what's the difference between a liberal state and an authoritarian state or authoritarian leaders and leadership? So these, these, these are words that all have shades of meaning. I mean, it's actually an excellent question. You know, I have a friend who studies uh, democracy and de de democratic decline around the world. And she actually doesn't ever use the word illiberal Democrat because in her view, it's a contradiction in terms. There's no such thing as an illiberal Democrat. You're a Democrat or you're not a Democrat. And the only form of functional democracy is liberal democracy. There isn't, a, there isn't an alternative. But never, I, I continue to use some of those terms because they do capture shades of meaning. Um, I mean, I think all of us grew up on the idea, I don't know, from watching movies, you know, that there's such a thing as democracy, and then there's a coup d'etat led by, I don't know, a colonel on a tank, and then, you know, they come over and they shoot up the presidential palace, and then we have dictatorship, and that somehow, you know, you have one or you have the other, and there's nothing in between. Um, one of the things that's become really clear over the last decade is that there are some forms of politics that are in between. Um, so we we have seen, for example, um, what it looks like um, in Hungary to have a prime minister who once taking he took power began to subtly and sometimes unsubtly alter the political system to make it very difficult for him to lose another election. Um, and we saw the same thing in Poland, very similar, um, a little bit clumsier actually, but. Um, we had a ruling party win an election, and of course, they're you know they were allowed to rule. Of course, they won, um, but as soon as they won, they began trying to change the rules of the system. So, for example, taking over the public broadcaster, which is very important function institution in Poland. It reaches you know something like a third of households don't have any other television, and they took it over and they made it party propaganda instead of being this neutral, more or less. Uh, neutral space, um, and they or they launched an assault on the constitutional court. Um, so they packed the court, they took the old judges off, they replaced them with new ones illegally and unconstitutionally. Um, does that mean there's no democracy in Poland? Not quite. I mean, we have opposition parties. We have, um, you know, still there are functional newspapers, and and there's an independent television station. Um, 
you know, you can you can criticize the government and not immediately be afraid of going to jail. I mean, this is not Stalin's Soviet Union, you know. Um, but but is there a sense of chill? You know, are there you know ways in which the system is ever less free all the time? You know, yes, there are. And so the term that we've invented for that is illiberalism or illiberal democracy. Um, illiberalism or illiberal democracy. Um, and this, um, you know, and, and this is, an, you know, it's sort of an, I mean, there are other terms you can use, you know, you can use authoritarian leaning or anti-pluralist or, you know, in the case of the Polish government, you can call them far right or nationalist. Um, we don't really have great words for what it is that they're doing because it's a, you know, it's a, I mean, it's, it's see, it feels like a new idea that you could take over a, you know, European Union state uh, um, and, and change its nature like that. But, but that's, that's the explanation for it. So we have something that's a, a democracy, but there's no longer any even playing field. Um, there's, you know, we have a democracy, but I mean, here's an example. Um, recently in Poland, a friend of ours, I mean, um, was arrested. Um, and for supposedly for a corruption case from a decade ago. Um, he's somebody who has been, he's not a politician, he was in the past, but he's a lawyer who's made a lot of trouble for the government by finding, he uncovered a big corruption story that implicated the leader of the ruling party. Um, the courts threw out his case because they said the prosecution hadn't proved anything. And the next day or a few days later, the head of the National Prosecution Service stated, oh, don't worry, we're gonna find something. You know, you know, and this is there's a famous Stalinist era. So, you know, give, you know, give me the man and I'll find the right paragraph, meaning the right law that will apply to it. So something like that mood is here. You know, you the we don't have a we don't have an absolute certainty of rule of law anymore. You know, if the government wants to arrest you, you know, for whatever reason, they're going to be looking for reasons to arrest you. Um, and that is a you know, it's not, it doesn't mean that there's mass murder, it doesn't mean there's mass imprisonment, but it does mean that there is a chill over what people are willing to say. Um, it means that people are aware that being, you know, being involved in politics, could you could end up paying a high price. Um, this is the kind of thing that's changed here, but does it mean that there's, you know, again, there's no dictatorship, but it's not quite a liberal democracy either. Yeah, so as you're saying, in the, the Polish context, you speak of the right, but it isn't necessarily right or left. It, it will vary with country and it will vary where, with where a country is in its right. development. So, so I'm actually working on a project, um, I, I haven't finished it yet, in which I'm comparing what's happening in Poland now to what happened in Venezuela a decade or so ago. In other words, what is the progress by this is after Hugo Chavez won the election and he had this whole theory of Latin American socialism, Bolivarian socialism, and you know, which is completely different from the, the, the ideology and language of the Polish ruling party. Um, and yet, nevertheless, some of what he did in terms of again changing the nature of the courts, changing the media, um, undermining the independence of prosecutors. Some of that is not that different <laughs> from what the from what the ruling party is trying to do in Poland. I mean, he had a big advantage, which is that he had oil money, which enabled him to go much farther, and so on. You know, so so I don't I don't want to say that these are identical cases, but the point is that whatever is the ideology you attack to this set of practices, you know, these under these you know, the anti democratic practices, um, the result is a weakening of the spirit and the norms and maybe even eventually the sense of rule of law inside democracies. But you can do it from the left and you can do it from the right. Right, it, 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 as you write, it's a mechanism for holding power, right? right. This, Regardless right. of which direction right. it comes from. Yeah, I mean, so you also describe it in a way that I think is, is, um, is important, an important thing for us to remember. You say that these systems really define in a country who gets to be elite? And in, in some ways, that's really the operative question. Who gets to decide is the elite, the powerful class, and, and what attributes and what powers and authorities do they have, right? Right. And, and, and one of the features of this new, whatever you want to call it, illiberal 
illiberal movement or populist movement or or far right movement in Poland and Hungary and and in, and in other countries is that it seeks to um, eliminate the, the current class of leaders and put in a new kind of person. Um, I mean, this, by the way, you know, I've written histories of um, of communism, and in particular, I wrote a history of the Sovietization or Stalinization of of Eastern Europe after the war. And this was explicitly their program. I mean, in Poland, there was an expression avant społeczny, which means, you know, social advance. And that meant we fire the university professors and we replace them with, you know, members of the working class. And that was a, um, and that was a deliberate policy. Um, and, and this is the, many of these movements and parties operate along a similar principle that what we need to do is get rid of everybody, whether they know anything, whether they're qualified, whether they should be there or shouldn't be there, um, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever they've done up until life, and we should replace them with people who are loyal to us, and we will decide what are the qualities that make you qualified to be whatever editor of state television or head of the diplomatic service or head of the, um, uh, you know, I don't know, head of the head of the of the food safety regulation organization. Um, and whereas, I mean, one of the accepted features and probably un, un, insufficiently recognized features of liberal democracy, you know, as we knew it from really from 1945 onwards, but certainly from 1989 onwards in, in this part of the world, um, was that there was an acceptance of the reality and need for certain kinds of competition and competence in certain kinds of jobs. So again, you know, people got promoted in the civil service. I mean, of course, there was an old boys network and so on, but people, you know, people who were totally incompetent or had no qualifications couldn't become head of the civil service or um, people who were not scientists couldn't become head of a scientific institute. You know, people who were not art historians or had no background couldn't become head of the National Museum. So, um, so there was some assumption of, of competence. One of the things that many of these illiberal movements have changed is precisely that. Well, why do we need someone who knows about art history to run the National Museum? Would, we'd rather have our friend run it, you know, who, you know, who will hire other friends um, and who will then create in the museum lots of jobs for people who are in our party. Um, and, that, and that is a very different attitude towards running the government and running public institutions um, than one that we've known hitherto. Um, and it is, of course, one that's familiar from other parts of the world and other times and other places. As I said, it's not that different from how the Communist Party worked. You know, it's not that different from how, um, you know, family-based politics works in in countries that are run by monarchies. You know, I mean, it's a, um, but 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 there was a there was an element of Western style, American style democracy that included this idea that certain kinds of jobs should be competitive and they should go to people with competence. There was a, you know, it was really, it was, a, again, it was a norm, not a law, but it was this idea that, you know, people should, people should have qualifications for the jobs that they do. So something you mentioned earlier, uh, and I think maybe it, it points to um, the, where we find ourselves. So uh, there was a time when these various systems of government liberal, illiberal, were easy to spot, right? It, it, the, the, the terminology was very simple and very direct. But when we're talking about a liberal states or authoritarian states, we have countries as varied as Tanzania, my old stomping grounds, and Venezuela, as you pointed out. But what's interesting is, as you put it, these are authoritarian systems clothed in democratic terms. Now, isn't in some ways all of this a tacit recognition of the importance of democracy and the desire for democracy that we find in people around the world. So it's no longer like it was at one time where uh, illiberal leaders, authoritarian leaders simply rejected democracy. They said, yeah, no, we're, we're not going to do that. We're not going to hold elections. Now they hold elections, they just fix them, right? They, they rig them or so um, reshape various institutions inherent in a healthy democracy and they bend them to their will. So uh, unlike in the past where there were good guys and bad guys and very easy to recognize, 
many of the bad guys claim to be good guys. It's just that they've rigged the system along the way. That's a really good point, you know, and, and that's actually something that's been in the air for a while now, um, you know, a couple of decades even, um, which is you're absolutely right. Um, one of the effects of, I mean, it's probably the long sort of the long tail of 1989, one of the effects of the collapse of communism and the democratic revolutions that followed in so many places was that it somehow be, seemed unacceptable to just say you were a dictator. Um, right. And, and the forms and, um, you know, and kind of, and language of democracy has been used in many places, even sort of farcically, um, but it does get used as a way of supporting dictatorships. I mean, actually the most interesting example of this is of course, Russia, um, right. which has elections, it has media, it has, um, you know, a public conversation, um, you know, it has candidates, you know, um, but of course it's, you know, it really is rigged um, exactly. and, you know, and Putin can't lose. But Putin nevertheless feels the need to have these forms and have these, um, this language as a kind of, you know, a way of legitimizing himself and legitimizing his power. Um, and you're right that the, um, the, the, the lip service that's paid right. to democracy and democratic ideals um, is an illustration, I think, still of the power of those ideals. Um, you know, people do care about those things and they do, people do want to live in a state where they play some role and they have some say in how they're ruled. Um, and I think even most of the world's dictators now understand that um, and, they, and they look to somehow incorporate that or use that as a way of, of, of maintaining their, their status. Right. So it, make, it makes those of us who are democracy advocates, it makes our work harder, right? It, because it is shades of, of gray. Yes, there are, there are many there are many shades of gray. Um, I mean, you know, Iran has elections. You know, there, there are many sure. there are key countries that are de facto dictatorships, um, which have elections or use some elements of democracy inside their political systems. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I think one of the most interesting parts of your book is your analysis and discussion of who supports illiberal states. In other words, it isn't just sort of one man or one woman who comes in and says, OK, everybody just stop. You know, I'm in charge. and We're authoritarian. Instead, it has a constituency. And, and you have this notion uh, citing a, a, another uh, a friend of yours who talks about uh, the authoritarian predisposition, and in her words, it's of about one third of the population or citizenry in almost any country in the world. So there is a market, there is a constituency for what we're seeing. There is a constituency. I mean, this is a, you're talking about Karen Stenner, who's a very yeah. interesting um, researcher and thinker and who has tried to establish um, you know, she's tried to define, as you said, there's something called not an authoritarian personality because that's too, you know, that's too definite, but a predisposition. Are there people who are susceptible to authoritarian um, language? And she concludes that there are, um, and that they are particularly bothered by certain kinds of political and economic and social change. Um, they're bothered by rapid change. They don't like it when society changes very quickly. Um, sometimes they're bothered by diversity when there's, uh, you know, there are lots of different kinds of people, you know, is, a, is something they find difficult. Um, some of them, many of them are bothered by loud and noisy debate. So, so this polarization that we've all seen in our countries, especially in the United States, and the loud kind of shouting, you know, that, that it creates oh. actually bothers people like that and in, makes them instinctively want to support anyone who will just make everybody shut up, you know, and there's a, they develop a nostalgia for um, homogeneity, simplicity, um, and kind of silence. And they, they prefer just one leader who will block out the rest because they're bothered by the complexity of modern life. Um, and she reckons that something like a third in most societies have, I mean, she's very interesting. And she argues that um, 
rather than deploring this fact, you know, people who care about liberal democracy should spend more time thinking about how we adjust society to accommodate for such people. I mean, that's sort of another theme. It's not really the theme of, of my of my book, but. Um, you know, there's also, of course, a, a more sort of profound historical point here, which is that it's a useful reminder, this kind of research, that the impulse to authoritarianism, both towards, you know, towards for, of the people who want to become dictators um, and the people who would prefer, you know, some kind of simpler form of government has always been there. You know, it always will be there. Um, our founding fathers knew it was there. I mean, Americans have this thing of, you know, we've been democrats, democrats for so long, we can't really imagine anything different. You know, we find it hard to conceive of having a different kind of political system, but actually the people who wrote our constitution were very conscious of the appeal of demagogues. And one of the reasons it has some of the oddities that it does, um, certainly the separation of powers, is to make sure that demagogues don't, don't, um, don't, don't win and don't knock the system over. So they were aware that this could happen. Um, and then somehow over the subsequent 200 years, we forgot. Um, right. And we forgot that this, this impulse towards demagoguery and the desire for simple solutions to complex problems is, has always been, been with us. And so um, reminding Americans in particular, because Americans do forget this, um, that we also need to constantly renew and replenish and invest in our democracy if we want to keep it um, is is really important. Yeah, and if, but I think also one of the things I really admire about your book is that you don't fall victim to what I see happen uh, with too many observers. So I think too many observers uh, are quick to stereotype those who are supportive of uh, more populist leaders or um, uh, I won't say necessarily an illiberal state, but less of a liberal democracy. And, and what you point out is that a, a lot of people assume that supporters of populism and, and a liberal state were those who are still carrying the burden of the recession of 2008, the refugee crisis of 2015. And what you write is, uh, the people I am writing about in this book were not affected by either of these crises. They are not poor and rural. They have not lost their jobs to migrant workers. In the United States, they do not live in communities ravaged by opioids. They do not, in fact, match any of the lazy stereotypes that are used to describe, for example, Trump voters. On the contrary, they have been educated at the best universities. They often speak foreign languages and they live in big cities and they travel abroad. So in some ways, I think what we've seen is people dismissing uh, those who, who perhaps are supportive of, of greater populism and, and perhaps some restrictions on, on a vibrant democracy instead of, as you've put it, trying to figure out how you reach out to them and how you uh, deal with some of the things that they see, some of the natural concerns that they have in ways that can strengthen democracy and not restrict democracy. So it's, it, I think that's an important difference in the way that you look at the challenges that we see. Yes, thank you. I mean, one of the things that drives me most crazy, actually, in the conversation about populism, it's actually even worse in Britain when they talk about Brexit, um, is this idea that it, there's some kind of lower class revolt and and that that's the that's the explanation for what's going on. I mean, Brexit was supported by the middle classes. It was funded by, you know, hedge fund billionaires. I mean, the idea that this was a, you know, some kind of poor people's revolt against against you know the rest of us is completely wrong. Um, and the same thing, of course, is true of Trump voters, as we just saw in um, you know in the last election. I mean, you know, the poorest Americans didn't vote for Trump. You know, or certainly not all of them. And lots of rich Americans voted for him, and, and many middle class Americans. Um, and so, you know, you know, imagining this in, in class terms. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's some kind of hangover from Marxism. You know, we want it's just a simpler way to see the world, and so we've got used to that. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that that a lot. Of, one of the other things that's been going on, um, you know, in the UK, in the US, and, and other places, is that we are watching 
one elite seek to replace another elite. And that was, we, we, we were close to this topic before, um, but you know, very well off, very educated, um, very well connected people um, have also sought to change the politics of their country because they wanted to be in charge. Um, and one of the one of the linguistic and rhetorical you know tools they've used is this conversation about attacking we're you know about the elites we're attacking the elites, I mean um, uh, you know the 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 you know I mean I don't have to tell you that you know President Trump's cabinet was packed with 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 millionaires um, you know the people who run Fox News are millionaires um, the presenters on Fox News are all millionaires I mean these are not these are not left behind people. Um, and yet they use this anti-elitist language in an incredibly, um, I mean, disingenuous and cynical way. Um, so, but yes, I mean, but, but, your, but your broader point is also correct. I mean, the, you know, the more we fall into these stereotypes and the more we right. think we, you know, the more we use them to, as a shorthand for explaining to what's going on. So I mean, that, the, you know, the harder it's gonna be to, you know, to deal with the problems. Yeah, you know, um, my friend Paul Ryan, uh, shortly after the election of 2016, when he was asked about why uh, then President elect Trump, why he won states like my home state of Wisconsin, which had not gone Republican since Reagan's reelect. And Paul put it well, he said, look, uh, people have to realize Donald Trump heard a voice that the rest of us didn't hear, that we ignored and we weren't reaching out to. So what I like about the way that you've uh, approached these challenges is you suggest that those of us who are, are trying to strengthen democracy, we had better reach out, we had better understand, and we had better find ways of helping people to engage in this sort of vibrant yeah. uh, democratic debate and, and not um, have them feel so marginalized or overwhelmed by some of the complexities of modern yeah. life. Yes. Mark, here, here's where we have to have a one second interruption where we're going to break the illusion that this is a television program and we're all in a studio because I have to, I have to find out what's happening with the electricity. Hold on one second. Okay. You said they need to switch off everything for five minutes. Okay, but my, my phone will yeah, work. I don't need light. You don't? It'll be completely dark. Can you wait for half an hour? Um, uh, I'm wondering what kind of light we have. Okay, well, anyway, if you have to do it, you have to do it. Sorry, we have to switch off the electricity now. Since I'm using my phone, that I won't affect. Some, some, uh, oil lamps. We can put up, we're going to put up candles. All right, All right. We'll, so, we'll keep. You know, so, Anne, this may be a really good time for me to approach the topic I was going to approach next. And that's the linkages between a liberal state and conspiracy theories. And, and so maybe now people are going to understand this notion of conspiracy theory when your power goes off entirely. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm left entirely in the dark, yes. And you're left entirely in the dark. So as I said, my phone should work, but there will be no light in this room for a minute or two. So, so um, because part of what would, in, in your uh, passages in which you talk about, you know, who is it that are, that, uh, is the constituency of an illiberal state, you point out that there are people who are often overwhelmed by complexity and, and perhaps noise in modern society. And they're also susceptible therefore to you know, conspiracy theories. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing conspiracy theories gain traction in ways that I think most of us didn't think were even possible. So, I mean, that's what a conspiracy theory essentially is. I mean, it offers a explanation of the complexities of the world um, in a way that makes sense to, to, to you know, to, to, to the readers. Um, it will knit, it will usually pull together. I think we may have lost Anne. And it so, will hold them together uh, into um, a story that makes sense. Yeah, you know, it, it, and 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 that's what they do, and they and they offer a kind of, um, uh, you know, they offer a kind of, you know, they well, they offer people the sense that they know something that other people don't know, you know, right. that they, 
that 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 you have figured you've got to the bottom of this complex problem and and you have special insight and special knowledge um everybody else thinks that barack obama is a legitimately elected president but you know he was really born in in kenya and that therefore he um, he shouldn't be president. And you have this knowledge, even though it's being denied by the White House and Congress and, and the CIA and whoever else, but you have this, this special knowledge. And of course, having that knowledge undermines your sense of trust and faith in your political system, um, but it gives you this special confidence and sense that you understand you understand what's really going on. Yeah, and you, you refer to that as, for those of us who grew up, grew up in the era when we looked at communism and the big lie, you refer to this as the medium-sized lie. So, right, it's, it's a little bit different than what we used to see, but that makes it more seductive in some ways. Yeah, so, so, so what it, it, it doesn't demand that much of you. You know, it doesn't demand that you believe in, I don't know, complex theories of economics or in a description of the future or, um, you know, anything, you know, it doesn't require that you read lots of books about Marxism. You know, all it requires is for you to have, you know, it, it instills a sense of doubt and a confidence that you have some secret knowledge that other people don't have. Um, and that turns out to be enough to reduce people's faith in democratic institutions and to make them begin to look for alternatives. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you you wrote this book. Uh, uh, when did you actually? When was the book actually going to press? So, I mean, just this what four or five months ago, six months ago. Yeah, I, I mean, the book the book was. I mean, I think the final final corrections were in you know April or May. You know, and then it appeared in July, maybe maybe June even, but. Yeah, because I it, part of what's in the book, and I encourage um, I encourage everyone to read the book, but also I think in particular to turn to the uh, pages on the pandemic. So that I think was remarkable because here, if you wrote this back in March and April, you could not have foreseen just the sheer scale and scope of the true pandemic and, and the collateral damage that we'd see in so many places. And so I think that that's remarkable. You're remarkably prescient on that. One thing though, you write throughout history, uh, pandemics have led to the expansion of the power of the state. But in some ways in the US, isn't the opposite happening? Because uh, we're seeing more and more people push back against the power of the state. And, and sometimes, uh, for ill purposes, right? I mean, I, I, I would argue that that we need strong direction from the government on how to avoid catching the disease and what to do of getting it. But in the US, there seems to have been much more of a put, pushback on the expansion of state power in, in the face of the pandemic. Yes, I mean, um, you know, historically, I mean, historically, the expansion, you know, public health reactions have expanded state institutions. Um, they have often caused, I can't remember now if it's in the book or if it's in a separate article that I wrote, but I mean, it is also true that they sometimes create counter reactions. Um, and I mean, I think we've had a series of different kinds of counter reactions in the US. I mean, in some ways, those huge Black Lives Matter protests last summer, I thought were also partly a reaction against the pandemic. People wanted to somehow be together outside, and that was another that was another version of it. But yes, you're right. The um, the 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 anarchic reaction against it um, is is um, you know it's it's just as remarkable as the as as the expansion. I mean, it may be that you know that what people keep asking me for the long term or you know what's the impact of the pandemic going to be on democracy. And one of the things I've been saying is, you know, ask me in six months or ask me in a year, um, because I feel like we've been through different cycles. Um, one of the things that I hope will come out of the pandemic, and this has happened in other countries, not yet in the United States, um, is that it has renewed people's interest in science and it has, um, you know, it has, it is certainly, you know, if you're looking around the world and you look at countries where they've been more successful than the United States, both in controlling the pandemic and in building public trust. I mean, you do see that those are all countries in which 
science is very high status in which there's some sense of faith in or trust in the honesty of government bureaucrats. Um, there's some deeper feeling of, of public trust. And the, the really successful governments that have dealt best with the pandemic have, have, ex have precisely been those that were, that were able to induce that. So, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, in the longer term, as people look back on, um, on these events, they will, um, they will, they will come to that conclusion, or at least I hope so. So you've actually brought me to uh, the question I wanted to ask, the last question I'll ask before we turn to the audience, and that is regarding the fallout from the pandemic when it comes to democracy, the state of democracy. And you write in your book, and, and, and let me just say, uh, uh, it, it is a book that has some heaviness to it. Obviously the topic is weighty, but you write uh, regarding the pandemic. Uh, this might be a turning point. Maybe my children and their friends, all of our friends and all of us, really who want to go on living in a world where we can say what we think with confidence, where rational debate is possible, where knowledge and expertise are respected, where borders can be crossed with ease, represent uh, one of history's many cul-de-sacs. In other words, this may be a turning point. We may be doomed like <laughs> glittering multi-ethic Habsburg Vienna or creative decadent Weimar Berlin, or maybe the coronavirus will inspire us with a new sense of global solidarity. Maybe we will renew and modernize our institutions. Maybe international cooperation will expand after the entire world has had the same set of experiences at the same time. So you're suggesting uh, that we might be at a turning point and you've created sort of the two possible paths Ann Applebaum, which one is it? What do you see? <laughs> Where are we going to go? You know, I'm, I, I didn't do predictions. And the reason I wrote that passage the way I wrote it was that I wanted everyone to remember that history is always radically open, that there, is, there, are, always, um, there are always more paths. You know, it is neither the case, you know, that the arc of history bends towards progress and democracy as we once hoped and and our our form one of our former presidents said nor is it the case that we're doomed you know that right. i don't know as civilization fell apart in the 1930s it will definitely fall apart again um and i wanted people to realize that we're at a moment of you know when when many things are possible and that the what happens next depends on how engaged we are civically how creative we are about reforming our institutions, you know, in my view, how creative we can be about changing the way the internet works and, and the information space, um, which are, have been so badly distorted. Um, you know, so, so the, 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 you know, whether we can tackle our problems and whether we can engage with them and move on, that will determine what is the answer. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and again, I, 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 um, I think it's remarkable that back in March and April, you saw it like that, because quite frankly, I don't think that most people understood the scope of the challenge that we were facing with the pandemic and what it would mean. So I, I think it's remarkable that you were able to crystallize the choices in that way when you did. So um, I, I want to give you great credit for that. Let me turn to some audience questions. Uh, a few have been sent in. I know we have more coming in and, and unfortunately we'll never have enough time. But uh, the first audience question is, what are some of the warnings that you would issue about the current state of democracy? And I guess you could break that apart into you know, domestic and, and overseas. So, I mean, that's a very broad question. I, I, mean, I mean, that's sort of the whole topic of the book. Um, I would point to um, doubt and lack of confidence in democratic institutions. Um, this we are seeing in a profound and terrifying way in the United States over the last month with the, um, the, the, the hysteria over an election that was actually 
extraordinarily well conducted given the conditions of the pandemic and the crisis that we're living in. And yet there seems to be a large part of the country that is not willing to acknowledge the result. Um, and much more disturbingly, a large number of Republicans who aren't willing to acknowledge the result. Um, and in, you know, I, I, even though I'm someone who spent a lot of time writing about that phenomenon, I'm still amazed by it. Um, that we, you know, that I mean, not so much the the, you know, the 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 the, the public, you know, is being very badly misled, but but members of Congress know that Trump didn't win the election, um, so so why can't they say so? It's a very odd moment, and so that is a bad sign, you know, when when leaders of our one of our main important political parties are unable to um, accept the result of a democratic election. That's a that that's a sign that there's some something deeply wrong. Um, I would say, also, I would always look out for, a, you know, open and aggressive assaults on the media, qua media. I mean, so there's always politicians who don't like this journalist or that journalist, but um, mm -hmm. but the dislike of the free press. Um, I would say, I mean, this is less of a well, it's a different kind of problem in the U.S., but. Um, for the same reason, attacks on the judiciary, you know, that the judiciary is, um, uh, you know, it's, this, this has happened a little bit in the UK and we've had this in Poland as well. Um, attacks on judges, attacks on the press, um, to some extent even attacks on civil servants, um, um, you know, the call for the politicization of the civil service. So, um, attacks on neutral institutions. Um, when politicians begin to do that, and when a large part of the public does that, I and mean, this is a bad sign, you know, bad sign for democracy. One of the things that democracy requires is that there are some nonpartisan institutions in place which operate no matter who wins the election. So no matter who wins the election, we need people, you know, we need an FDA to regulate our new vaccines. And once we, once politicians begin to attack the FDA um, and say, there can't be a neutral FDA, there has to be a Republican or a Democrat FDA, we, have to, we need to fire everybody at the FDA so that they're partisans. Once you have, once they begin to talk like that, democracy is in trouble because you need some nonpartisan institutions in order to keep the system in place so that, so that each election takes place on a, on a, on a level playing field. So uh, I've been accused of being overly optimistic, and I am optimistic. I think we'll get through all of this, and I think we will be renewed and refreshed as we are with every election. So then, uh, given what you've just said, I'm going to ask you a tougher question. And the tougher question is, what are you optimistic about? What are you most optimistic about as we sit here today looking forward? So I am, although many people disagree with this, I am very optimistic about young people um, and the generation of people in their 20s um, and maybe even, you know, who are just entering, you know, the world and the job market and public life now. Um, it seems to me that we now have a, there are a lot of people around who are interested in public service and who want to, who understand that there are deep problems and want to be committed to solving them. I mean, I only say this because I hear from them a lot. People write to me and, you know, for advice or, or, or um, I've had students um, in classes that I've taught. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I feel there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of talent and energy and interest in fixing public life in a way that I don't, I don't even think my generation had, you know, we had this idea that, there was nothing really in particular we needed to do for democracy. It was just going to happen. You know, we just need to vote every few years. Um, and I have this feeling that there is a there are a lot of creative and entrepreneurial younger people around now, more so than than there were um, in, in in the past. And I also have a lot of faith in the in the um, in the kind of civil society sector in the. Um, you know, the, the, the new and energized democracy groups in the United States, I'm part of some of them, some are public, some are not, um, who have really dedicated themselves to, um, to, to thinking about the problems and fixing them. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of talent and philanthropic energy going into these problems, and that makes me really optimistic. 
you know, what I also get optimistic about whenever we see these challenges around the world, like we're seeing in Hong Kong, or the, the tragedy of Hong Kong, we also have to admire the extraordinary courage of the citizens and the advocates who at great peril are staring down the tanks and, and are willing to throw themselves into peaceful protests. So to me, they're always inspiring and they represent something yeah. that we can all build on. Yes, I mean, I feel that same way about these amazing protests in Belarus. I mean, right. somehow it's, you know, the, these people going out every weekend and sometimes just in their own neighborhoods because the streets are blocked in the center of their cities um, and, and, and marching because they care. I mean, it's extraordinary. And it's been, you know, on and on for many months now. Right, and all around the world. The ladies in and white all in the world. Cuba. Yeah, it, it's an extraordinary thing. Question we received, um, it would part of the way to tackle conspiracy theory be to be more transparent in our intelligence operations? What do you think? I don't think that's the source of conspiracy theory. Um, I mean, um, I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think that's the. I don't think that's the reason why we're seeing this phenomenon. Um, um, I mean, maybe we should be separate on, you know, as a separate issue, maybe we should be more transparent in our intelligence operations and that we could debate that exactly what that depends what you think that means. Um, but I don't think that's really why um, the, you know, QAnon is spreading across the United States. Um, I think that's happening to do because it's to do with the way the, the information on the internet is structured. It's to do with the grave and profound doubts that have been created in our political systems and in our knowledge systems. Um, it's because we're living through this kind of epistemological break where um, people aren't sure anymore about sources of knowledge. Um, and um, so I don't think it's directly to do with intelligence operations. Um, yeah, and, and I, I would say to our, to our uh, viewers and listeners, uh, Anne writes at length about how um, algorithms in the internet have unfortunately made this worse in the sense that almost anything you visit has attached to it some additional click on options that are meant, that are aimed at keeping you longer on the website and therefore longer uh, in, in terms of the consumption of, of media. And that does exacerbate the temptation. Oh, to yeah, no, no, this, 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 yes. This, this, certainly Facebook, YouTube, and, and um, Twitter and other forms of media are um, designed to be addictive. They're designed to keep you online as much as possible. Um, and they will force you down rabbit holes or persuade you to go down rabbit holes. You know, if you're interested, whatever you're interested in, right. you know, if it's a particular kind of pop music, you right. will see more and more of it. But, and if it's a particular kind of politics, you will see more and more of that. You'll always see that little uh, piece on, on wherever you visit that says, readers were also interested in, and then there's a whole long line right. of things that, right. that some algorithm is determined can keep you uh, uh, more attentive to the screen. Uh, one of the other uh, questions, should we simply accept the fact that it is more difficult to manage democracies than dictatorships? I mean, I'm not sure that that's true. Um, you know, I mean, some dictatorships are well run, but quite a lot of them aren't. You know, um, there are a lot of badly run, chaotic dictatorships, um, and there are a lot of really well run, highly functioning democracies. Um, I know it probably to Americans, it probably feels that way right now because our system is so dysfunctional. Um, but actually, just this morning, I was on a telephone call. Um, uh, and it was doing an interview with a, you know, a, a minister in the government of Taiwan, um, which has performed beautifully during the pandemic, has is really successfully fighting conspiracy theories. And we were talking mostly about vaccine and 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 pandemic conspiracies. But and you know, and they're faced directly with the threat of disinformation from China, which is interested, you know, very interested in destabilizing their country, and yet they've managed to function pretty well. Um, and so, and they're a democracy. Um, so I'm not sure that that's true. You know, I mean, it depends which democracy and which dictatorship. So we're running short on time, but one question touches upon something that I was hoping to ask. Um, so you wrote recently in the Atlantic a, a piece that I thought in some ways was an update to your book. 
uh, the article's called, The World is Never Going Back to Normal. And, and you say, none of America's relationships with friends or with rivals is the same as it was four years ago. Some on the Biden team will be tempted to restart relationships and reboot old plans as if nothing has happened. And that would be a mistake. Do you see signs of that with respect to what we're hearing on, uh, on China or Iran? that there is the temptation for some to want to go back and pretend the last four years didn't happen when in fact the world is in a very different place. So I hear both. I mean, certainly um, the people in the Biden administration I've spoken to or close to the Biden administration, um, um, will, if you talk to them, they will reassure you and they will say, no, we don't think everything's the same, you know, and we, and we aren't going to go back to what we were doing before. Um, and even I think, I mean, I don't want to. I, I don't have very, you know, I don't. I can't make any predictions. I mean, even in the case of Iran, where certainly I think they will go back to Iran and they will try to restart the conversations at least about controlling nuclear weapons. I mean, I think they're pretty sanguine and they they understand it might not work. I mean, I don't think they have a lot of illusions. And I and particularly in the case of China, I don't think they have illusions there either. I mean, I think they perceive both of those, they understand how things have changed. And, you know, I mean, I suppose the, the, the thing I'm more worried about, um, I'm more worried about how they treat our allies. Um, and they, you know, we, I don't know, we have a big meeting in the spring sometime and everybody comes and there's a, we raise a glass of champagne and say, oh, we're all friends again. That would be, in some ways, that would be a real disaster um, if it ends there. Because what we really need as allies and as democracies, um, what we need to do is to is to is to begin jointly solving some of the problems that afflict all of us. You know, one of them being this problem of disinformation and distortion on the internet, the role of the of the of the big internet platforms. We could solve that together more easily than separately. One of them being the problem of kleptocracy and the use of laundered and dirty money in all of our politics. Um, you know, those kinds of big problems, you know, we really need to work on together. Um, and unless somebody is really committed to doing that, you know, then it's all going to end. You know, there'll be some kind of party at, you know, at the, at the, you know, in 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 Macron's presidential palace or somewhere, and you know, everybody will drink cocktails, and then nothing will happen. And and that's that's the thing I'm more worried about, rather than Iran or China. So I've got one uh, last question I'll ask related to that. And unfortunately, because it's so uh, limited in time, you're going to have to summarize an entire school of thought into a sentence or two. But you make you write in this article, which I thought was was a, a quite a brilliant piece. America's return to UN institutions that President Trump has left or said he would leave won't rid them of Chinese influence or make them more functional. The task is to come up with an absolutely new way of conducting diplomacy. One solution might be for the U.S. to shun international organizations altogether. Do you see that as a realistic possibility, a realistic path? I don't think we're going to shun international organizations altogether, but um, we need to rethink how we use them and how we participate in them. Um, and we need to, um, um, you know, we also need to think about how in the modern age to achieve things, do we always need, you know, we need a secretariat and a bureaucracy and right. a bunch of calls in order to do something, or are there better, faster ways of achieving things? I was very inspired during the pandemic. I had a long conversation with a virologist at, um, at Johns Hopkins Medical School who, um, who told me how scientists operate. I mean, it is really extraordinary. I don't think most people realize that the vaccines that we're getting now were actually invented in February. You know, um, right. all that happened in the intervening months is they've been testing them. And the reason they were able to move so fast is because the scientific community moved so quickly. Even the Chinese contributed with their, you know, their genetic analysis of the virus. Um, immediate ch exchanges of information were stuff happens so fast now because this is a community that's integrated. It's used to working together. Um, you know, people know how to trust each other. And I kept thinking, you know, what if international politics worked that way too? Um, you know, are there, I, I, I wasn't, I, I'm not calling for abandoning anything. I'm just asking 
diplomats and statesmen to look at how other spheres, other parts of, you know, you know, other, 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 other actors in the world do act together and cooperate internationally. And are there things we could learn from them? Again, it goes back to something earlier. Um, President Trump often saw things that other people didn't see in the sense of, of, of recognizing there are problems in many of these institutions. They aren't without need of reform. And so to pretend there isn't a need for reform, that we can go back and pretend there is there isn't a need would would be a mistake. Um, you know, I could go on forever. Fantastic. <laughs> I recommend the book to everyone. Thank you for joining us in our discussion today. Thank you to everyone in the audience who tuned in. Uh, this has been great. And, and as you can see, uh, Anne is not without opinion, not without uh, um, experience. And she cares deeply about uh, democracy, human rights, Western leadership, and uh, the, the notion of responsive governance that recognizes the centrality of human dignity. So uh, to everyone, please keep an eye on your inbox for our 2021 authors and in, insight schedule starting in January. The McCain Institute wishes everyone a happy, healthy and safe holiday season. And once again, Anne, thank you, deeply appreciate it. Thank you, Mark, I appreciate it. Sorry for the little technical issues. Um, um, I, happy Christmas, Merry Christmas to all of you and, and you know, best of luck in the new year, thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, Anne. Thanks. Okay, everyone. Happy holidays.